So following from my previous article where I talked about muscular failure in a very general sense, um, well, let me quickly summarize that. The one sentence summary of the previous article is muscular failure occurs when the muscle's ability to produce force falls below the force requirement of the activity. So if the, a given activity requires 100 units of force and your muscles can generate 120 units, you can complete the task. If and when fatigue causes your muscles to only be able to generate 99 units of force, you can no longer complete the task. And that is the definition of muscular failure. Um, that's the easy definition of muscular failure. Because as always is the case, the weight room has to make this far more complicated, right? On a bike, you simply can't maintain the pedal cadence. You're doing one of those stupid thumb studies where you press, you can't maintain enough pressure. The weight room is more complicated. So let's talk about that. Defining muscular or task failure in the weight room is much more complicated for a number of reasons. One of them is that over, well, the century or so, uh, that weight training has really been, been done, um, multiple overlapping definitions have been used. And simply saying, I went to failure, doesn't really say anything in the weight room because it could mean one of four or five different things, depending on who you're talking to, depending on what definition is being used. Now, this may sound like pedantic nitpicking, especially coming from me, but it's not. Because the specific definition of failure that you're using can drastically impact on what's being done. And I'll get to this in part three. Unfortunately, I'm, as usual, far too wordy, right? So if you have two people talking about their training and they both go, well, I trained to failure, they're using different definitions, they're having a very meaningless conversation. In a research sense, if multiple studies are using different definitions, and many of them do, that makes them even less comparable than they already are, right? We've already got this problem that very few studies do the same thing in terms of the number of sets, the number of reps, the rest interval, the exercises chosen, the training frequency. And then as I've kind of talked about, when I talk about training, or when I talk about training frequency, when you mix 10 studies that are all different, I think you end up with gray paint when you do a meta-analysis because nobody is really replicating because nobody will just do what the previous study did to see if the results are the same. They always use different sets of variables. Clarity matters here, both in a practical sense and a research sense. And this lack of clarity, this lack of standardization adds another level of complexity to an already complex topic. So let me try to uncomplexify it and that is that is a word it is now as always let me start with some background a little bit of what will seem like minutia but i think is sort of important um first thing you need to realize is that there are three types of muscular actions there's what is called a concentric muscle action this is when a muscle shortens under load there is an isometric muscle action when a muscle generates force with no change in muscle length. There's an eccentric muscle action, which is when a muscle generates force while lengthening. Now a couple of pedantic notes. Older terminology, they used to call these muscle contractions. There's a concentric muscle, concentric contraction, eccentric contraction. The problem is contraction implies or denotes a shortening. You cannot have an eccentric muscle contraction by definition because a muscle cannot lengthen and shorten. So some number of years ago, it's probably been a while, they adopted muscle action instead. Second, the technical strict definition of an isometric muscle action is that the muscle does not change length while generating force. And this isn't entirely true. In the very initial stage of an isometric, uh, there's a little bit of slack being pulled out of uh, the tendon and connective tissue, and there's a little bit of shortening, at which point there is no further shortening. This is just truly a pedantic note, but people love to nitpick my articles, my articles only for these little minor what they see as mistakes. That's why I cover my ass like this, just to shut the nitpickers off at the pass. Let me finally note, eccentric strength 
is stronger than isometric strength, which is stronger than concentric strength. You can lower more than you can hold, which is more than you can lift. All right, from that, I want to talk about in that there are three types of muscular actions, there are three types of movements we can do in the weight room, right? The concentric phase or movement is lifting the weight. Muscle shortens, doing a bicep curl, lifting is the concentric. An isometric, holding the weight. Now, this means holding the weight under load, right? Like if you pause at the bottom where there's no tension in a bicep curl, that's not an isometric muscle action. If you hold it in the middle, the muscle is generating force with no change. So that's just holding the weight. Then eccentric is lowering the weight. The muscle lengthens under load. So in a bicep curl, curl it up, that's a concentric. If you were to lower it to the middle and hold it, that's an isometric. If you just lower it all the way, that's an eccentric. All right. When, for most of what we're talking about here, especially hypertrophy training, generally you're going to see coupled concentric and eccentric actions. You lift the weight, you lower the weight. There are exceptions. Olympic lifters drop the lifts from the top. Some power lifters, after their deadlift, they will drop very quickly with their hands on the bar. It's not really what I'm going to talk about. So we're talking, I'm really focusing on muscular failures pertains to hypertrophy, so we're talking about combined. Yes, I know there's studies that used only concentric lifting or only eccentric lifting. Generally, don't do that in the weight room, so I don't care. The isometric muscle action, whether or not that is present really depends, right? So on a leg extension, right, where there's resistance at the top, lifter might squeeze hard and hold it at the top. That is an isometric muscle action. You are shortening under load. Same thing with a leg curl. In a bicep curl, even if you held the top, like I guess if you really squeeze hard, that's kind of an isometric, but really it would be more holding it in the middle uh, without letting it move. Um, bottom position tricep press down, same thing, you can squeeze at the bottom is kind of an isometric, but uh, I mean it is, but not really in the terms I'm talking about it. End point of a cable crossover, squeezing in the middle, peak contraction. Holding a row in the back, another Example of an isometric, you're holding it against load. But these are all situations where that isometric is at a peak contraction, right? So a lot of movements that don't have that, there's really no, no bodybuilders or people seeking hypertrophy wouldn't typically do an isometric. So as, a, as an example, power lifters may do this, right? Some power lifters will do like a partial deadlift to below the knee and then hold it. So they are gen they're doing an isometric contraction muscle sorry isometric action against load and that is to strengthen specifically that point above the knee. Olympic lifters may do the same thing. They'll bring it to the knee, then you lower it into a full wrap, or they'll from that pause they'll do a full wrap. But for hypertrophy training, it's pretty rare, so I'm not really going to worry too much about that. So in as much as that there's three types of muscle actions, there's three types of muscular failure that we can define because failure can technically occur during any of those phases. Concentric muscular failure is able to lift the weight. Now, part three, I'll get deeper into the definitions, the different definitions. For now, I'm just going to add through a full range of motion. So if you start a biceps curl, 100 pounds, can't get past the middle of the movement to get to the top, you've reached momentary concentric muscular failure. Let me reiterate, this is not muscular exhaustion. You can put down the 100, pick up a 90, do a few more reps. You don't want to lift that, you pick up the 80. This is not muscular exaction. Muscular exhaustion would not occur until you could literally not bend the arm with no weight. Nobody trains like that. Or almost nobody I've ever seen. We also reiterate, failure is only momentary. If you were to put the weight down, rest 15 seconds, pick it back up the 100, you might do another two or three reps and then reach muscular failure a second time, right? Rest, pause, dog crap, my reps, whatever you want to call it. So that concentric muscular failure is A, not exhaustion, and B, momentary. Okay, isometric failure would be an inability to hold a weight without moving. So imagine you're doing your bicep curl and you hit the middle and couldn't get through the, the, the middle point. But then you just held it there as long as you could. And eventually the bar would start to move down again. That would be isometric muscle failure. The inability to hold the weight against load. Very few people train like this. Um, some of the super slow, high-intensity training camps used to, to, to do this kind of thing. They are big on what they called inroad, training to maximal fatigue. So when they would hit failure, they would fight against that isometric for 5 to 10 seconds, and then they would wonder why they were exhausted for a week before they could train again, because it's very stressful. I don't generally recommend this. 
in regular training, it can be a useful training tool, and I'll talk about that and demonstrate this in part four. Eccentric failure would describe an ability to lower a weight under control, right? So put a bunch of weight on, top of the bicep curl, more than you could lift, and start to lower it. But you have to be able to control it, right? It doesn't just drop. Usually this is qualified with a lowering time, like four seconds or two seconds, right? So if you're trying to lower it over four seconds and can't, you hit eccentric failure. Um, true eccentric failure might be defined as the total inability to control the weight on the way down, right? Like you start and try to control it and it just drops. You cannot resist it at all. Um, in as much as few go to isometric failure, almost nobody goes to eccentric failure. Exceptions are like, dipshit gym bros who live for force reps on the bench press and will keep having their partners lifted up and so until they just can't control it at all. I don't generally recommend doing this. Um, it, it's very stressful. It gets dangerous very quickly. It either requires very specific equipment to avoid getting wrecked or spotters who are willing to put up with your bullshit and lift the weight up until you they get bored and let you crush your sternum. Now, eccentric training can have its role, not failure, right? Sports like powerlifting, super maximal eccentrics are often used, but sporad very sparingly. Um, my athlete Sumi Singh, powerlifting, about four weeks before her meet, uh, will do a single heavy eccentric rep with 105 to 110% of her max. This is, A, it can help with her control on the way down, staying tight, it, it gets her used to the weight on the shoulder, but... I, I'll put the video up. I count the four-second uh, lowering. She usually stretches that out a little bit longer. But again, we don't... One, two, three, four, five. We don't generally go to eccentric failure because it gets very dangerous um, very quickly. So for the rest of this article in part three and part four, I'm really going to focus just on concentric failure. Right, people just don't generally train to isometric eccentric failure. So when I talk about momentary muscular failure, I'm talking about concentric failure. I know there are studies examining isometrics and eccentric training. Don't care. They usually use specialized equipment. Can't really do much of this in the gym. That's not how people train. As well, all the studies and the volume war stuff, and a lot of this is a long-winded way to to finally up update my um my training volume series use concentric failures as definition. So that's all I care about here. Um, so again, I'm only talking about concentric failure, the momentary inability to lift a weight through the full range of motion. Again, qualify this more in part three, look at all the different definitions. And again, while this seems pretty simple, it's not in the weight room because now we got to talk about biomechanics, primarily the sticking point. Okay. In a conceptual sense, Right. The sticking point of any exercise represents the position in that movement where the force requirements of the activity are the highest relative to force output. Right. So there's a paper I linked in the article and I'll put in the notes. They state, in the context of resistance training, the so-called sticking point is commonly understood as the position of the lift, which a disproportionately large increase in the difficulty to continue the lift is experienced. Right. And we've all experienced this. When you bench, there's that point in the middle that it becomes the hardest, and then it gets easier as you, same thing with squats, curls, any movement, right? Without getting really deeply into the physics of it, I'll let someone else do it or maybe a further article series. The sticking point occurs when the perpendicular distance between the weight, the, the resistance, and the axis of rotation is the longest, right? This is when the lever arm, which is that perpendicular distance, is the longest. This is where the greatest force, strictly speaking, the greatest torque, because this is rotational, will be required to continue moving the weight. So, image you can see looking at barbell curls, right? What I've drawn is a curl from sort of mostly the bottom through the middle to the top. The red line is the lever arm. It's the perpendicular distance between the axis of rotation, which is the elbow, and the line of force, which is that down arrow. Start short at the bottom, gets a little bit longer. It's the longest when the form is perpendicular because it's the full length. Gets a little bit shorter and then shorter again at the top to get the lockout. Um, I should mention, I left this out of the graphic, the biceps lever arm is also changing. Right now the biceps is closer to the elbow, so the lever arm is shorter. 
Um, at the very bottom, the lever arm on the biceps is the shortest. It's longer in the middle, gets the longest at the sticking point, shortens and shortens again. This interacts with a third factor, which is that muscles, it's called the length tension relationship, and I don't want to get too deeply into it. It has basically it says that muscles or muscle fibers generate force at an optimal length. When it's too stretched, you don't get the best force production. When it's too shortened, because they're crunched up together, you don't get and in the middle. So you've got these overlapping biomechanical factors. We're at the bottom, the lever arm for the of the weight is the shortest. The lever arm of the biceps is also the shortest. The biceps are also on stretch. But in general, like I said, if you've done a curl, it's easy to start. It's a little bit harder. Hardest in the middle. Easier, easier. Um, and that middle point, when the lever arm is the longest, will generally be the sticking point. A consequence of this, or the consequence of this, is that the only place that the biceps will be maximally taxed in terms of the force, their force requirements in the middle of the movement. Right? If you cannot generate sufficient force at the sticking point, the rep cannot be completed. As the same paper I will give you the link to says, if the lift is taken to the point of momentary muscular failure, the sticking point is usually where failure occurs. Now note the word usually, because it's not always the case. Right? Uh, size of the sticking point, you always do goofy shit and change your form, right? People will, so for example, if you're doing a bicep curl and get stuck, some people will curl their wrist back. Now what's that doing? It's shortening it's shortening the lever arm, right? Normally the lever arm would be the length of the forearm. If I curl it back, it makes it a little bit easier. Or they'll just lean back and use other muscles. You'll also see sometimes that someone will get a weight through the sticking point, but it takes so much energy that it fatigues the muscle so much that they then fail a little bit above that. Right, you've all had this happen in barbell curls, right? You get to the middle and you fight and you fight and you fight and you fight and you generate so much fatigue that suddenly you can't get to the top, even though it should be easier. So failure will not always occur at the sticking point, but in general, that's where it tends to occur. Same old for like tricep pushdowns, same thing. Easiest at the top to start, harder, hardest at the midpoint when the forearms are perpendicular, it gets easier and easier. Um, Right now, people cheat on that too. You can again flex the wrist, brings the weight a little bit closer. Some people flare the elbows, little pecs work, or just lean forward. Use a little bit more body body English. Now, not all movements work like this, right? Not all movements have the the the, the lever arm in the middle. Leg extensions are a good example. In a leg extension, this is also in the graphic. Here's your upper leg. Here's your shin. Right at this point, the weight's here. Lever arm's the shortest. A little bit longer little bit longer. It's actually longest at the top. So it starts easy, harder, harder, hardest at the top. So that's where the highest force or highest torque requirement will occur in, in leg extensions. Generally you fatigue so much you don't even get there and leg extension machines change this a little bit. Um, but that's why these movements are called peak contraction movements. The maximal force requirement occurs at the top rather than in the middle or possibly at the bottoms. You have to do some weird biomechanical stuff. <laughs> what about compound movements? Um, I'm not gonna talk about them. It's way more complicated because now you're dealing with multiple muscles working across multiple joints and changing biomechanics and lever arms and muscle lengths at all of them, right? Think about it in a bench press. You've gotta change it. The shoulders, the elbows, wrist even can move around. You've got the pecs moving from one range, the delts, serratus, triceps, the principle is the same. The sticking point will still tend to occur where the force requirement of the movement is highest relative force production. In the bench, where does it usually occur? In the right, it's so when the forearms are, are parallel to the body, right? That's when the lever arm is going to be the longest because it's going to be the length of the arm. So it's typically if your elbows, it's a little bit easier. You start, get stuck in the middle, and in premise, it's getting easier at the top because the lever arm is shortening and shortening and shortening. But then again, People often get through the middle and don't reach lockout, right? Go to powerlifting meet, a raw powerlifting meet. This has to do with a couple things. One, it takes so much force to get through the middle, you may be too fatigued to get to lockout. You've got changing muscular involvement, right? Bottom tends to be a little bit more pec dominant. Your triceps are proportionally weak. Not only are they fatiguing early, they may not let you get to lockout. Um, so complex movements. Or, or sorry, compound movements are much harder to deal with. I don't feel like drawing free body diagrams because I'll probably just get them wrong. So I'm not going to get into that.
The principle is the same. It's just way more complicated. So all of this has an, a couple of important consequences in the weight room. Okay, so the first one I already mentioned. Only portion of the movement that a muscle or muscles will be maximally taxed is at the sticking point. And again, so compound movements, it gets very complicated, but if you're looking at some of barbell curl, right? The force requirement of the biceps will be lower at every part of the movement than in the middle. Only the sticking point will be maximal. At least this is true for free weight movements, where gravity is unchanging, right? Nautilus, Arthur Jones, and Cybex in these early machines tried to get around this by making the cam. And what the cam was doing with the cable was changing the lever arm from throughout the movement in an attempt to match the force requirements better to the force curve of the exercise. That was the goal. Not going to get into whether it worked or not, but it was altering the resistance throughout. Rubber tubing works very differently here. Um, rubber tubing generates resistance as a function of the stretch squared times k, what's called the modulus of elasticity. So what happens with tubing, right, is the movement is trivial. The tubing is not stretched or stretched very little, and it gets exponentially harder throughout. So tubing may not cause failure to, because may not cause maximal resistance at the sticking point. It gets much more complicated, right? Let's say you're doing a tubing bicep curl. There's literally no resistance at the bottom, or almost none. It starts to get harder. In the middle, the lever arm is the longest, but the tubing isn't stretched fully. But as you get to the top, the lever arm is shorter, but the tubing is maximally stretched. Whether or not the middle point or the top or whatever will be the highest force requirement, I'm not doing the math. I'm just saying that tubing is a little bit different. And what you find with tubing is once you get past a certain tubing thickness, a movement that is trivial to start physically cannot be completed, no matter how strong you are. You'll do like a tubing chest press and it'll be like easy and you'll just cannot finish because the tubing, the resistance is exponential. Um, other approaches, Jerry Telly, who most of you probably never heard of, tried to alter the, the, the relationship by having you change your body posture throughout the movement. Um, it never, he never finished his book. I had his video. It was interesting, but it was really impractical in my opinion. Um, other approaches have been tried. Uh, Isokinetic machines that they use in rehab use computers to sort of adjust the resistance. The harder you push, the harder it pushes back to try to be maximum all the way through. There was these shitty pneumatic machines back in the day that used air pressure, and air pressure is where the harder you push, the harder it pushes back. Um, those are, you don't see those very often. I've seen modern computer machines, the gym I worked at years ago, that Basically, had you do a maximal rep, and then it would adjust resistance, but they broke down all the time. Um, chains and bands is another way to adjust this, although it's it, it's really only at the top, right? So in like a squat or a bench, where it tends to get easier at the top, if you put chains on, easier at the bottom, doesn't it's a little bit harder at the sticking point, and at the top where you're getting stronger, that's when the resistance peaks, and tubing does it just exponentially. So again, in powerlifting, frequently you get stuck in the middle on a maximum rep. It generate so it's it's also just a way to improve that lock. And it's also really good for geared geared competitors because the gear tends to throw you out of the bottom. You're having to lock out more than you could actually get through the sticking point if you trained if you competed raw. So again, it's real easy to understand for isolation movements. Right? For compound movements, it just gets super complex again for the same reason. Multiple muscles working across multiple joints with changing lever arms, force outputs, and force requirements. You start getting into issues of limb lengths, biomechanics, relative muscular strength, and all of these all go and determine when and how someone might fatigue or fail. Right? So someone is bench pressing. Let's say they stall off the chest, right? which is common. That's where the lever arm is. This simply that that has implications for how hard the pecs, delts, serratus anterior, triceps are working. And this changes throughout the movement. But this also impacts which of those muscles actually hit muscular failure. So let's say you bench to failure and you fail off the chest. Actually, no, better example. Let's say someone's triceps are their weak point and you rep to failure in the bench and you hit failure because your triceps, you can't lock out the final rep at the top. 
we can probably say that the triceps reached muscular failure. But does that mean the other muscles did? Can we say anything about the pecs? Can we say anything about the anterior deltoid? What if they fail off the chest? Presumably the chest failed. Okay, does that tell us anything about the other muscles that are involved? The answer is that no, it doesn't. Whereas if I'm doing, someone's doing a pec deck, and they failed, their pecs have failed. Fine, yes, someone will be, it could be biceps, which has a minor role, it could be anterior deltoid. Yeah, you know what I mean. In an isolation movement, unless, assuming you maintain good form, the primary muscle involved in that, when you have failure, that's what failed. In a compound movement, it's much harder to say. Right, so think about squats. Say someone is power squatting, and their low back is the weak point. By definition, when they are unable to complete a rep, it's because their low back cannot do what it needs to do. Does that tell us anything about the quads or the glutes? Did they get a training effect? How close to failure were they? Didn't they get a training effect? We can't say. It will depend on biomechanics. It will depend on the differential between the quad. So if quad and low back strength is very similar, failure in the low back may be very similar to failure in the quads. But if they're not, if you've got a weak low back, or if you've got mechanics that you're bent over like this, and your low back is getting stressed proportionally more than your quads, when you hit failure, that may have nothing to do with your quads. Nothing at all. It may have anything to do with your low back or your upper back. Which is why, despite what the internet says, that you have to squat or you're a pussy, people with shitty mechanics generally don't find squats to be a very effective quad movement because it's not their quads that are limiting. When they hit failure, it is not their quads hitting failure or possibly getting anywhere close. For those people, not everyone, for, the, for people that have good mechanics, squats can be a great quad movement because their, squat, their quads are what limit them. But for that reason, the people with shitty mechanics may find that a leg press where their low back is no longer limiting is way better. Because now the muscle that's actually the target muscle is what's fatiguing or hitting failure rather than an, un, an isolated, uh, an uninvolved movement. The same holds true for other movements, right? Consider the whole strap issue, another area where you are inundated with macho bullshit. If you're performing rows or lat pull downs, any pulling movement, and the grips, and your grip gives out, your grip might, your forearm kind of got a training effect, but did your back? Depends. If your grip is weak, if you have small hands, women tend to have a weaker grip than men. Your grip is limiting you, possibly long before your back gets a training effect. Same holds for an RDL. If your grip is limiting you, you're not getting good hamstring. Say, what about a deadlift? If you're deadlift, if you're doing deadlift reps, your grip gives out. Are you training the other muscles of the deadlift effectively? Can't say. Because we know that there's some, as I talked about in the training volume series, we know that there is some threshold of intensity, whether it's load or fatigue, which is required to stimulate growth. But it needs to be in the target muscle. And if the non-target muscle is what's limiting you, you may not be getting a training. You might. You may be getting less than you would otherwise. I'm not saying you don't. I'm not saying we don't know. I'm saying that the non-target muscle is limiting you. So in a practical sense, this matters in terms of determining what is a good exercise for any given individual for any given muscle group. If someone is not built to back squat because their mechanics or because their upper lower back is weak, it will not be a good exercise for them to build the quads because it's not the quads that are giving out or even possibly getting close to failure. Give them a movement such as a split squat or a lunge or a leg press where they take, where you take the lower and upper back out of it because they're more upright or the low back's out completely. They generally find they get better results, right, for them. It's only those trainees for whom their biomechanics and relative muscle strengths allow their quads to be the limiting muscle who will find squats to be a particularly good quad movement. And the people who think squats are the bomb are built for it. But this also matters in a research sense. Right? Because a lot of studies, far too many in my opinion, use exclusively compound exercises. Right? Some use a mix, but many, Brad's volume study did, the Hahn et al. study that Mike Isertel was on did, they're not alone. And this matters because if you're trying to make any statement about volume of training, and all you say is someone did a ton of barbell bench press to failure, or in Mike's study, four reps from failure. Do we even know what muscle failed? 
or what muscle might or might not have received a training stimulus? No, we don't. Because you're using, because of the complexity of compound movements and relative muscle strengths. This becomes a bigger issue because all these goddamn studies measure peripheral muscles, right? If you're bench pressing and all you measure is the triceps, this, you, I don't think you can include hardly anything, right? Now, I've seen at least one study that measured the pecs with ultrasound. And why more studies don't actually measure the prime mover is beyond me. I don't know if it's incompetence, laziness, or what. If you're going to do nothing but barbell bench press, measure the pecs so we can actually make some sort of useful statement, right? Even if, the, even if we, without defining failure, we have to ask what is actually failing in the movement or even getting close enough to failure. This is important because we have research. Again, some studies will use a mix, which takes a little bit of this out. At least some of the comments I've made about counting sets for compound isolation muscles is related to this. But if you're talking about muscular failure, if you're moving from the model of effective reps or failure being, or being close to failure as a stimulus, and a compound movement, if that's all you're doing, where we don't even know necessarily what's failing in the movement, it's hard to make meaningful statements. Which, you know, maybe a study should just do that. Just do all isolation movements, right? Because at least then, if you do 45 sets a week of nothing but pec deck and you measure the pec, those results might be meaningful. Those might actually tell you something about training volume. But as it stands, doing barbell bench presses to a possibly problematic definition of failure, and I'll talk about that next time, doesn't allow you to conclude much, especially when you ignore your statistics. And that's where I'm going to cut it today. That's just the first set of issues in the weight room. Biomechanics, some physiology, some ranting and raving. Next time, I'm going to talk about the different definitions of failure and why we need to be clear on which one is being used, because they're very different. We'll start out that discussion by first looking at the concept of the repetition maximum, the RM.